whether you found us on the net or you're part of the church family, we welcome you today. I'm Russell. I serve as the pastor of the Church Charge of Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett, North Carolina, and also Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina. Some of our members have been asking for an outdoor service, so here we are. <laughs> Actually, this is our backyard, and um, this is one of my favorite places to be. Uh, about last uh, Sunday, we had a meeting with our church team, the Pastor Parish Relations Committee, about reopening the church doors. We met in the afternoon last Sunday to start the conversation about the issues that we face in restarting worship in our buildings. There were two responses to all of the questions and also the input that you gave to our committee. The first answer that we came up with is that we have just begun to work on the guidelines and requirements that we will observe when we do once again gather and are able to meet in our buildings. Secondly, we have set a date for our first uh, worship service and it's going to be an outdoor worship service. It's going to be on the first Sunday of July. That's July the 5th. I will meet as a body uh, for a joint worship service, the two churches together. We're not going to have Sunday school yet, but we will meet in the parking lot of Pleasant Hill Church. So mark that down. We'll meet in Pleasant Hill Church's parking lot, and uh, it will be, though, at Mount Zion's worship time at 9.30 a.m. So uh, it'll be a little bit cooler in the morning, and, and that will be a good thing. We'll have some more information in next Sunday's bulletin about the important points of social distance, the do's and the don'ts of meeting together, etc., I want to say a special thank you to our committee for gathering and keeping social distance last uh, last Sunday and give a thanks to all who participated with giving the committee information for worship uh, to consider. Thank you so much for all of your uh, participation. This morning our message is uh, going to be from the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. An angry group of religious rulers has just overseen the stoning of Stephen, a very devout follower of Jesus, and God uses this crisis to scatter the disciples far and wide. The circumstances of the early church were not unlike ours today, so we can take some lessons there. They were evicted from their town. We've been evicted from our worship buildings. Uh, in both cases, the church was scattered, and the question becomes, how shall we respond? So, a few heads up, get your Bible and uh, open it to Acts chapter 8. We'll have a children's message in just a few moments. But before we do that, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we worship today, there are many who bow their heads wearily. There are tired spirits and heavy hearts because of losses and struggles. We know that we're supposed to praise you and thank you, but Lord, sometimes the crises are really hard and all we can think of is a single syllable, help. So Lord, for those who are struggling with spiritual questions and weakness of spirit, we ask for faith to believe. For those struggling with relationships that are stretched to the limit, we ask for love to persevere. Lord, for those struggling with economic issues that have no clear path, we ask a barrel of Elijah's meal that just never seems to run out. Lord, for those who are struggling with losses because they were faithful, we ask for a revelation of your smile upon their works. And Father, for those who are struggling with grimness because loved ones suffer, we offer and we ask for the needed moments of the laughter of the redeemed. And for those who are touched by the violence on our land today, we pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh touch of healing and peace. Lord, there's no shortage, there's no lack of supply for any of these requests on your part, only our faith and your choosing and whether we choose to receive. And right now, Lord, we choose faith. As we begin to come out of the times of quarantine, we pray for signs of your hand to overwhelmingly bring restoration of peace and joy. And we pray in the mighty and matchless name of your holy child, Jesus. Amen. So, if you're going to do some preparation, hit the pause button and we'll wait. 
Go get your Bible and a cup of coffee, if you will. Your Bible should be open to Acts chapter 8. And when we come back, we'll have a message for the children. And then, let's worship together. Hi guys, Pastor Russell back again. We got a message about um, some things that have been going on this week. We've seen a lot of things on the news about um, some really sad events going on all over the country, protests and so on. And so I have a question uh, that starts off something like this. There are times when the crowd jumps on somebody. Here's the question. What do you do? Well, what choices do you have? I think there are three choices. You can join the crowd and jump on that person. I mean, get ugly with them, get mean to them, even doing physical harm. You can join the crowd. You can try to stop the crowd. At the very least, the third choice is speak up. If you see something that's not right, speak up. Jesus said we ought to love God, and we know that. But he also said we're to love our neighbor just in the same way we'd like to be loved. And so we need to hear that. And we need to ask ourselves the question, anytime we see something going on that doesn't seem to be right, what is the most loving thing that I can do for this person? And I think uh, it may be best illustrated by a little story that I heard a long time ago. There's a little girl who had a friend and her friend lost her doll. And so on the way home from school, uh, the little girl went with her friend to her friend's house she called her mom and she said, I'm going to be a little bit late if that's okay. My friend lost her doll and we're at her house looking for it. Mom said, okay. And uh, it was very much later that day, many hours later that day, just before dark when the little girl finally got home. And mother asked her, what in the world took you so long? You were so long. What was going on? Well, my, I told you, mom, my friend lost her doll and I was helping her look for it. Well, it couldn't have taken this long. Well, we never did find it. Well, why didn't you come home? Well, my little friend was crying. Well, I'm sorry for her, but why didn't you come home? She said, well, I stayed and I helped her cry. See, sometimes there's not much of an answer for things. Sometimes we just need to cry with people in their loss or in the difficult times that they're going through. So, God wants us to be helped. He wants to help us and we have to stay close to him. We have to pray and we also have to decide a lot of things all the time. So let's do that. Let's ask him for wisdom to help us decide what's the most loving thing we can do for our friend whenever our friend hurts. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we know that you do want to help us. You love us. We ask for your blessing as we try to help our friends. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Our message today is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, reading from the New Living Translation this morning. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning, but Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. The setting is pretty clear. Stephen is stoned to death, and it touches off a great persecution in the early church in Jerusalem. And frankly, it scatters people everywhere. The believers go everywhere. It's worth a look to notice that the clergy, the preachers, were left behind in Jerusalem when this great persecution happened. Some people would understand the laity, the disciples, to be fearful and they ran. Others, perhaps more discerning, might see the way that God does things here. He turns just about everything, whatever is in sight, he turns it on its ear, turns it upside down. In this case, God actually turned things right side up because God doesn't make mistakes. 
Jesus gave his disciples marching orders just as he was about to ascend back to the Father in heaven. He had been crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, and walked with the disciples for uh, 40 days and uh, then went back to heaven on the day of ascension. And he told them that they would be his witnesses. First in Jerusalem, where they were located, where their home was, then Judea, the outlying area, and then Samaria, even the farthest parts, the place where most of their enemies lay. And then he said, you're going to extend my gospel, my good news, all the way to the ends of the earth. You can read that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But the question remains, why use the followers? Why not the clergy? Isn't that a job for the leaders? I suppose a simple answer there is yes, but only if you're not planning to turn the world upside down. And therein is the rub. God always turns things upside down. Paul wrote about that in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, his letter to that Corinthian church. He said this, God shows things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. You expect to hear the religious stuff from the professionals, but that's not what God wanted. That's not what God wanted spread throughout the world with the souls of untold millions at stake. What God did want was the pure, unadulterated truth about Jesus backed up by the lives of those who willingly chose to put everything at risk to follow Christ. The clergy, the apostles, if you will, set the stage in sharing from the religious base in Jerusalem. That's like a preacher at his church. It was the laity who took the message out of Jerusalem, out of the church, if you will, and ran with it. Now, if you think it's tough living today as a Christian in a world that's uh, seemingly gone absolutely mad with unbelief and violence, you're probably right. It is hard. But God, I believe, is up to something in our day. Something is happening, and just maybe it will not be the religious professionals who change things. It won't be the religious professionals who turn this upside down world right side up. I learned something in 11th grade about having the world, your world, turned upside down. It was 11th grade and when your whole life revolves around football practice and games and math tests and wondering if you'll get into college, it is hardly going to dawn on you that something history changing is happening 1600 miles away in Dallas, Texas. On a clear day in November 1963, President John F. Kennedy was killed by a sniper as he traveled the streets of Dallas, Texas in his motorcade. There have been volumes written by the press over the last nearly 60 years, investigations, conspiracy theorists about this event, but today that day, I should say, that day I just thought it was a strange thing that they canceled football practice. In the upcoming days, though, I watched on TV the funeral and the unfolding drama of the accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald being shot to death live and on camera by a man named Jack Ruby. All of it was bewildering and incomprehensible to a 16-year-old whose depth of thought did not reach past watching Andy and Opie trying to make sense of Aunt B and Barney every Monday, Monday evening. Digress. Go back about 1800 years and you have Tertullian. Tertullian in the second century was a Christian author who wrote about the overwhelming persecution of believers which started with the stoning of Stephen that we read about in Acts chapter 8. Stephen was one of the church's first deacons. And Tertullian wrote that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You don't get a crop unless you plant seed. Tertullian made that analogy by saying the blood of the martyrs, those who are killed for Christ's sake, that's the seed for the church to spread, to, for God to have a crop. Trying to make sense of the stoning of Stephen a century after the fact, Tertullian had the hindsight perspective. He could look back on that wave of persecution that swept over Jesus' disciples and how that bloodbath scattered believers everywhere. And in the flight, in order to avoid torture and death, 
the gospel was carried around the world, the known world at that time. And this is a scenario that has been played out over and again in history. Every time there's a move to stamp out the church, it's like pouring water on a grease fire. The kingdom of Christ spreads with ferocious faith despite threats and threats made good. It's strange to think how such events as the stoning of Stephen, as well as the modern day assassination of a president, can inspire such movements. I mean, kingdoms topple, paradigms shift, hearts are rearranged, all because evil wants to strut itself, strut its stuff. But God shouts back with calm resistance. In just the last week, this country has been turned upside down again by the death of George Floyd, who was pinned under the knee of Derek Chauvin. Now, all week, the protests have turned ugly and lethal with no sign of backing off. And I'm not here to judge where that's concerned. I'm not here to judge George Floyd or Derek Chauvin. On the one side, people see a black man caught in the oppressive, excessive force of the ruling class representative, a rogue cop. On the other side of the street, supporters of the police officer cry out for preserving law and order. In the case of Stephen and the early church, Saul was part of the mob. He was given the coats of those who were going to do the stoning, and he was to watch those coats, make sure nobody stole them. They were going to commit murder, and they wanted to make sure their coats weren't stolen. But it would not have been out of character, I think, for Saul not to just to hold the coats, but to yell encouragement to the stoners to inflict death on Christ's witness Stephen. Sometime later, it was Saul who would have his own heart and life changed, rearranged after a meeting with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus gave Saul a new name. He changed his name to Paul. We have that name as the author of fully one-third of the New Testament scriptures. That's evidence as to just how drastically a life can change with when the blood of a martyr becomes seed in your history. Paul could not get the memory of Stephen's blood covering his body with those rocks lying around out of his mind. Jack Kennedy, by contrast, was not a martyr for the cause of Christ. He was hardly what you would call a saint. He was a politician. He was beloved. He was despised by political types and people not political, but a fallible human being with a reputation for infidelity. That's, uh, I mean, we know a lot about Jack Kennedy. We know a lot less about Stephen, other than that he was a well-respected leader in the early church who did not keep his mouth closed when he had the opportunity to be a witness for Christ. Neither did he keep silence when they threw the stones to knock the life out of his body. Stephen died begging God to forgive his killers. A question that comes to mind for us all is to what star are you going to hitch your wagon? What's going to light your fire? What is it that's going to get you busy doing something? Would you leap into a movement for a president who's gunned down heroically promoting his political agenda? Or would it be for a suspected felon? Would you leap into the debate on the side of a policeman whom you believe was wrongly fired and arrested for murder? Or would it be to join Stephen, a nobody erased by an angry mob simply proclaiming the agenda of a heavenly kingdom? Which seed would you plant? And under what circumstances would we begin? What could cause you to get in the game? The early disciples hoped Jesus would end all of the violence that Rome brought into their lives and bring the heavenly kingdom down on earth. They got their hopes turned upside down with another dose of Golgotha, the place of the cross. Another good man pinned with nails and disgrace to a crossbeams. Those followers of Jesus didn't count on it. Their hopes were for an easier, better life as Messiah would take over and everything would be fine. What they got was their lives tossed and the threat of losing everything. They wound up hiding in their homes. That sound like quarantine to you? 
hiding in their homes, afraid to get close to anybody or trust anybody or anything. They lost their jobs. They lost families. They were pulled apart from their loved ones. Some died in the arenas, torn apart by lions or gladiators. Some were burned to death. Now, come back out of that period of time to just three months ago when you first heard the word coronavirus. You know what it's like in the here and now. In Jesus' day, it was a political and a religious upheaval that turned life ugly. Today, it's a virus that has affected jobs and family and social life, caused the whole world to wonder if anything will ever be the same again, if there's ever going to be any such thing as normal. And will our response to all of this be as heroic and faith-filled as the early disciples? That's the question. Will we risk everything for the cause of Christ and the needs of our neighbors? Will we do, as I asked the children, that one question, asking God to show us what's the most loving thing we can do for our neighbor? Time will tell. Time will tell if we will huddle like cornered, frightened sheep or stand with a clear message of hope. Time will tell if we're going to hoard our resources or use what God has placed in our hands to deliver that kind of hope. Time will tell if we will be the church without buildings or we will have buildings and fail to be the church. Could it be the call of coronavirus that makes you leave the building for the playing field? Time will tell. Let's pray. Father God, we've been chased out of our buildings by a bug so small we can't see it with the naked eye. And in light of the strength of your gospel that has withstood the onslaught of everything Satan can throw against it for all of time, we know that you have allowed this for a reason. Help us to cooperate with that reason. For the glory, honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son cooperating with the Spirit to honor and lift up the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives. Amen. Thank you, friends, for stopping by and worshiping with us today. May God richly bless you.